disease. We have a talk by Dr. Epen. I would like to invite our moderators for the session. Dr. Shalimar, who is a keen researcher in the field of hepatology. He is professor of gastroenterology at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Then we have Dr. Sunil Taneja, the second moderator. He has immense research work in the field of hepatology. He is professor of hepatology at PGI Chandigarh. I'll request the moderators to introduce the speaker and the subject and carry forward the session. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So a very warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining with us today for this masterclass series conducted by the ISG. We all know Professor Epen is an expert in liver disease. He's presently working at the Christian Medical College, Bellor. And we all are immensely very uh, keen to listen to him regarding his topic today. The most important thing which I would like to say over here is his ability to make things so simple. And we all know how he makes difficult things so easy to understand. As highlighted, this is a very common, but it's a very difficult to manage clinical scenario of alcohol-related liver disease. We now know that across all centers and zones in India, alcohol-related liver disease is the most common diagnosis with which patients are at and Professor Epen has been working on alcohol-related liver disease and has published a lot of papers on this aspect. In addition, he has also worked on other diseases, including the Bud Carey syndrome, acute liver failure, and his work on von Willebrand tract. I'm sure this would be a great learning experience for all of us. May I request Dr. Sunil to take forward the proceeding? Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I welcome you all to this uh, masterclass on alcohol related liver disease. And I think we all are aware that alcohol has become a big problem in India. And it's the leading cause of alcohol cirrhosis. It's a leading cause of cirrhosis now. Uh, I think two most common causes which have gone up in the last decade is one is alcohol. And the second is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And the alcohol consumption per capita in India has gone up significantly. In, especially in states like Kerala and Punjab, you know, we are just, you know, dealing with so many patients with alcoholic liver disease that it sometimes we feel that, you know, most of our inpatients are just alcoholic liver disease only. And we are going to talk about the prevalence, the epidemiology today, what is the spectrum and I think the management of this disease, which is, you know, it's at times we feel that it's not even difficult, but outcome is also not very good if it is diagnosed at a later stage. And the kind of spectrum which we've started seeing is the advanced form of alcoholic liver disease. So I think this is a very important topic which we are going to discuss today about alcohol use disorder and alcohol liver disease, how it is going up in India and how do we have preventive strategies to control this alcohol use. Secondly, how do we detect this disease early and treat this? So with these words, I think I welcome Dr. Epen and I think uh, he, he, he doesn't need any introduction. He's the professor and head of uh, hepatology at CMC Bellore and he has extensive experience in dealing with alcoholic liver disease. Uh, professor Epen, it's uh, to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sunil and uh, Shalimar. Let me thank ISG for this opportunity to, to talk at this ISG Masterclass series. I must appreciate this uh, venture. It's an uh, in, important educational activity, and this is part of a series of talks. So let me start with sharing my screen first. Are my screens visible? Yes, it's visible. Yes, visible. Okay. So uh, the topic is really alcoholic liver, uh, alcohol related liver disease. And can the you, way. Can you make it slideshow? Okay. And the way I've pitched it is uh, this is main, aimly, uh, aimed mainly at the residents in gastroenterology and hepatology, as well as uh, faculty consultants from who have finished training and would like to brush up what are the latest in this field. So first of all, the names change with the times. So what was earlier called alcoholic liver disease is now considered to be a bit discriminatory for the patient. 
and has carried some stigma with it and is currently suggested the name should change to either alcohol related liver disease or alcohol associated liver disease so this is the uh, framework of what i would like to cover and i will start with how do we identify a patient with harmful alcohol intake so there are some definitions the term now used is alcohol use disorder this is defined as an impaired ability to stop drinking alcohol despite adverse social occupational health consequences now as per the dsm 4 uh, which earlier had terms like alcohol abuse and alcohol dependence dsm 5 has replaced these terms with alcohol use disorder and this can be categorized based on the symptoms in the mild moderate and severe 35% of patients with alcohol use disorder would develop alcohol related liver disease later now to screen for patients with harmful alcohol intake some tools have been developed this is a tool developed by the who where alcohol use disorders inventory test or the audit tool has got 10 questions in it the first three questions are on consumption of alcohol then is on dependent symptoms and alcohol associated problems and the total score can identify a person with either harmful or hazardous alcohol use as well as patient with alcohol dependence how are the new term for that is moderate or severe alcohol use disorder the screening tools uh, for uh, uh, looking for problem alcohol consumption are abbreviated and the most uh, commonly used ones are the cage questionnaire and the audit c audit c refers to the three first three questions in the audit questionnaire the c refers to the consumption of alcohol so uh, we are familiar with the cage questionnaire the audit c looks at how much these are the questions literally on on the audit c looking at the ac- alcohol consumption in the past one year studies have compared both the cage questionnaire and the audit c and it's felt that the audit c is more efficient to screen for problem alcohol use and better than cage to identify alcohol misuse however these screening tests do not diagnose alcohol use disorder and rather it points to the need for formal assessment so some more definitions what is heavy drinking heavy drinking refers to a person who's consumed in men of more than 4 standard drinks per day and more than 14 drinks per week i'll come to definition of a drink later and for women is more than 3 drinks per day or more than 7 drinks per week binge drinking also comes as heavy drinking what is binge drinking in men a person who consumes more than 5 drinks in 2 hours or in women more than 2 4 drinks in 2 hours is categorized as binge drinking moving on to how do we calculate the amount of alcohol consumed by a person now this is a bit challenging actually and this is how it goes so uh, first we take a history to find out how much or what type of alcohol is a person consuming and what is the amount the person is consuming so this has to be then converted into the number of standard drinks of alcohol is the person is consuming and from that we calculate the grams of alcohol the person is consuming so the who standard is that one standard drink of alcohol is equivalent to 10 grams of alcohol on the other hand the nii ni triple a uh, definition criteria says that one standard drink is 12 to 14 grams of alcohol so the audit c i refer to this as a, the brief screening tool for problem drinking the first part of that uh, administering the tool is to asking the person it can even be a self administered tool to consider a drink as for example a bottle of beer beer so this is how a standard drink is first has to be converted from the type of alcohol and the amount of alcohol patient consumes into a standard drink so the first step is to convert that into a standard drink 
So that is what is ne needs to be done. So uh, this one example, uh, some descriptions of this given by Syriac Phillips in this article, where uh, let's look at beer. So beer is five percent alcohol by volume, and twelve ounces of beer would be one standard drink. In contrast, wine is twelve percent alcohol by volume, and five ounces would be one standard drink. And when we have more concentrated stuff fortified wine, distilled spirits, etc. The percentages go up and the volumes come down for what is a standard drink volume. This uh, is information from an article from published by the AIG group in Hyderabad where they have uh, looked at Indian indigenous um, forms of alcohol use as well and how to convert that into standard drink. So they have also given uh, how does the person quantify the amount of alcohol taken? For example, using the word quarter or ada or full or a peg or a patiala peg, etc. And how do we say what is that amount the person is talking about? And then how can we convert that volume with the type of alcohol consumed into a standard drink? So in I am now referring to this particular study, Mithun Sharma is the first author from AIG Hyderabad, which came out this year, where they studied the pattern of alcohol use in Indian patients with heavy drinking. So they had 950 patients with heavy drinking for more than two years. 38% had cirrhosis. The commonest drink consumed was whiskey. They found that the median uh, alcoholic drinks per week was similar in patients with and without cirrhosis. But those with cirrhosis, more patients took indigenous alcohol. So this study had some interesting findings. The, patient, the lit, literacy uh, rate had seemed to have some bearing. The cirrhosis was more often found in illiterates. People with higher educational qualification had lesser prevalence of cirrhosis. I started by mentioning that it's a little difficult to calculate the amount of alcohol being consumed by the doctor. It looks like most patients also in this particular study were not aware of the amount of alcohol they were consuming. So it's not only a doctor problem, it's a patient problem as well. In fact, if you ask us a question, who knows how much alcohol is being consumed by a patient? By a patient, maybe the patient may know, may not know. As per that particular study from AIG, those who are more educated seem to probably are more aware how much alcohol they are consuming. The doctor caring for the patient can identify a person who's at risk of of harm from alcohol but then may not be able to accurately judge or gauge the amount of alcohol being consumed by the patient. A researcher into alcoholic liver disease would have more accurate information. However, one, one challenge is we are going by the history that the patient gives based on a recall, and that itself is one challenge here. What about the alcohol industry? Would they know how much alcohol is being consumed by a patient? I guess they know, but for the home brewed or cottage industry for indigenous alcohol, I guess that is unregulated and the amount of alcohol being consumed by a patient probably is not known. The regulatory authority in India as well is probably aware of the alcohol consumed by a patient, however, not for the indigenous uh, alcohol drinks. This has got a lot of implication for regulatory purposes and for public health uh, uh, aspect of it, which is what I want to highlight from this. I'll now move on to the spectrum of alcohol-related liver diseases. So we are all aware that alcoholic liver disease, alcohol, now the term is alcohol-related liver disease, go through a spectrum. The person drinking alcohol would initially have a normal liver, and then over time, the person gets simple steatosis or alcohol-related fatty liver. This step may be reversible 
on stopping alcohol. It's possible that the person with simple steatosis may go back to a normal liver if I stop alcohol. With progressive damage to the liver and with the body's response to the damage, the person ca can go on to alcoholic steatohepatitis. That is a histological term, the clinical term of which, equivalent of which is alcoholic hepatitis. Some patients then develop fibrosis in the liver, going on to alcoholic cirrhosis, which can then, in some patients, lead on to hepatocellular carcinoma, and the cirrhosis can get decompensated as well. So this would be the full spectrum of alcohol-related liver diseases. How do we recognize these uh, stages of alcohol-related liver diseases? What are the diagnostic tests that we do? So it's uh, commonly based, we're looking at the liver functions and imaging. The person with just fatty liver, simple steatosis, would mostly have a normal liver function test or very mildly abnormal liver function test with a fatty liver on ultrasound. The person with alcoholic hepatitis typically have AST greater than ALT, should be more than 1.5 the ratio and raised bilirubin, and the INR starts to get prolonged. About two-thirds of, of such patients, especially those with more severe grades of alcoholic hepatitis, would have clinical features of a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So these patients with uh, severe grades of alcoholic hepatitis are more and more sick. The person with alcohol-related cirrhosis would have features which are seen in any other cirrhosis. They would have deranged liver function tests, there's an uh, AG reversal, there's a prolonged INR, and evidence of a chronic liver disease and ultrasound. Patients with hepatocellular carcinoma is again like in any other cause of liver disease, uh, how hepatoma is diagnosed, elevated tumor markers like alpha phytoprotein and finding a focal lesion on the ultrasound uh, or other scans. Liver elastography is now increasingly uh, in uh, clinical practice, and one can expect that the liver elastography, the liver fibrosis, increase in fibrosis would be picked up by the liver elastography. However, an inflamed liver per se also can cause increased liver fibrosis, and that's one point to keep in mind when you use this tool. What are the management strategies? How do we treat these patients? The prime importance is to advocate abstinence. So one is to figure out, identify the patient who is at risk of harming himself or herself. So what is the problem drinker or harmful amount of alcohol being uh, consumed? And then to encourage abstinence is the key at all stages of liver disease. But specifically now coming to the patient with simple steatosis, there is no other particular treatment now available. So it is really only alcohol abstinence. A person with cirrhosis due to alcohol, the treat management is standard treatment of cirrhosis of any cause. There is no other particular therapy apart from alcohol abstinence. The person with Hepatocellular carcinoma caused due to alcohol. Again, the treatment is the same. Standard treatment of hepatoma as of any other etiology of liver disease. There's no particular treatment, especially for alcoholic etiology. However, it's a different story in a person with alcoholic hepatitis. A patient with severe alcoholic hepatitis are at risk of death within the next 28 or 30 days. So there is a high short-term mortality. And how to approach this is a topic by itself, which uh, I will be covering in the subsequent slides. So I think I will uh, stop there. And maybe this is a time for running the poll questions or taking on some discussion points. Now, meanwhile, the poll questions are coming up now. Uh, Salimar and Sunil, can you just take up some questions which have come in the box, or you can ask directly the questions. Uh, I think we've got um, 
lot of questions in the chat box. I think we'll go step by step. So what has been covered till now in the talk, we'll focus on uh, those particular questions. So um, apart from uh, what you mentioned uh, regarding is the um, uh, clinical presentation. So in the evaluation part, especially in the younger group, uh, which um, is a question over here is like uh, associated drugs and other. So how, how do you evaluate such patients for other potential causes um, apart from just alcohol? Because history sometimes is not very reliable. And the other question would be is how reliable is the history of alcohol consumption in such patients? Okay, uh, I'll try. Thank you. I'll try to answer that. It's a very important point that it's uh, crucial to identify what all etiologies are driving the illness. And typically, in a tertiary center for, center, for example, a patient would have gone to one or two or three hospitals before coming to this hospital. So it's inevitable a person will be on different drugs, which can either be modern medicine or alternative medication. It's inevitable. Now, how do we know the drug is causing it or it is only alcohol causing it? So there is this term called drug-induced liver injury. But I see in this area, there's a need for a new term. The new term is, in India, it's common practice for most patients to take drugs to treat the jaundice. So it is not drug-induced liver injury. It's another category. So I became jaundiced, let us say, because of alcohol-related liver disease. And now what do I do? So I'm going to usually to an alternative medicine practitioner and taking drugs to treat the jaundice. So when such a patient presents to, uh, to a hospital under modern medicine, we may start saying that drug is also potentially causing it. Now, we do not know whether it's causing it or not. So like Shalima mentioned, it's a complex area really. So whether any of the drugs are itself driving it. So there are tools to analyze that. So there are scoring systems to say, how does one diagnose drug-induced liver injury? And that should, again, inform us and think about how the treatment will go with that. Uh, can, meanwhile, can we have the questions also in between? Yeah, sir, I have a, a small question. Uh, we've been trying to quantify alcohol based on this 10 grams, the one drink is equal to 30 grams of alcohol. But I think in India, a lot of people consume country-made liquor. So how do you really quantify that? And, you know, you tend to get more severe disease with the people who are consuming this country-made liquor. What is your thought on this? Yeah, thank you, Sunil. That's a very valid and important question. So one is, I think it's something which we have to invest in. We should know, is it true that this percentage of alcohol in, in the indigenous liquors are what is stated in liquor? So how can we... Uh, you know, there's a need for some research into that, as well as how can that be regulated as well. So uh, there is no, I, I suspect there is nothing like that right now. So there is, uh, it's a need of the hour. And uh, beyond that, I do not know, but it is a need of the hour. And second thing which we have noticed is that a lot of people who consume alcohol, now the, the consumption of alcohol has significantly come up in the younger age group less than 21 years also. So the average age group where people start consuming alcohol is now 17 to 19 years in India. This is There is data available on this. And a lot of times they are also have, taking other drugs like, you know, uh, there's a lot of IV drug abuse also. So what we have started seeing is alcohol plus hep C and other infections also. Uh, so, I mean, what, what do we do about it and how do we go about it from here now? So this is a, a, a serious problem of public health implications. So it's not only us. We are seeing one end of the spectrum. The interventions which will bear fruit are earlier in the in the whole system. So one has to figure out how can we reduce IV drug abuse? How can we influence behavior patterns in this age group and provide you know, positive intervention that? Those are needed, as uh, which is beyond our speciality, but surely it is needed in our country. And a think tank is needed to intervene in this area. So the questions are coming now. So when it comes, you know, before that, you can actually have one more question by the time. And now it has come. Okay. Yeah, yes. Good. So this is a question. And this is a response. 
Abhi? Very good. Okay. So, I, I think uh, that's Sunil. correct. It's an uh, answer. Is yeah. So, everybody is listening. Is yeah, is everybody is listening. So. Hello, admin team. You have directly shown the uh, response. Okay, I think what out is uh, Ipan. Yeah, yeah. Comment on the slide. Yeah, so uh, this converting to a standard gram, now, standard drink, you are not and calculate. Ipan. It's not on my end. Sir, you are audible, uh, sir. Please yeah, go ahead. Audible, yeah, audible, audible, audible. Okay, so converting to a standard a drink of alcohol is the first step in this assessing calculating the amount of alcohol. However, it is a little. Even, even you are mute. Kind okay. So the conversion into a uh, into standard drinks and then calculating the grams of alcohol is the first step uh, needed in in calculating the amount of alcohol uh, being consumed. However, that is a little so, somersault. Each time, so we have to figure out how can uh, we make it easier to do uh, some things which are again challenges, which will be good for us to address in our country. So, when we talk about this spectrum of alcoholic liver disease, till what stage do you think is reversible? Uh -huh. uh, I do not know the answer there, but I would look at it this way. The first, the earlier part of any illness is potentially reversible, but in the later later stages of the illness, we are looking at interventions which can retard or stop progression of the disease. So that is, these are opportunities of intervention. So the more we understand that better. So again, these are uh, topics which wide open for research in our country as well. Are any of the reversible, or in any of them, uh, when can we? retard and thereby reduce progression of disease and complication. That's how we should approach it to say. Dr. Ipen, is there a role of vitamin E as uh, in the early stage where we have a fatty liver because of the alcohol as in uh, as we have in uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? Thank you, sir. Vitamin E is an antioxidant. So that is uh, how uh, theoretically is the logic of using that. The reality is there have not been studies addressing that, in, you know, so we do not know that answer. It's highly likely that any patient with what we stage any spectrum in the in the alcohol liver disease would be getting vitamins, not necessarily vitamin E. We have to write something for the, the prescription, <laughs> but it's, it's possible. I, I guess there's no harm in giving some vitamins. Now, do I specifically give vitamin E? No, I did not do that. But... As a general statement, that's uh, how I would approach that. So, yeah. so, another clinical scenario which we commonly see is that people who are consuming alcohol all will not develop alcoholic liver disease. A lot of them would have fatty liver disease also, non-alcoholic non fatty liver disease. So there's a combination of alcohol plus non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So uh, do you think that this is relevant This this at this clinical scenario now that we have to try and differentiate both or it's like we can continue with alcoholic hepatitis or alcoholic fatty liver disease and so on. Okay. Thank you, Sunil. So this is an increasing problem in India and we are seeing persons who have a combination of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and alcoholic liver disease and thereby even the nomenclature is changing to enable both to come together. If you use the word NAFLD, I could not categorize a person who is taking alcohol into that. But if I called it uh, MAFLD, etc. So it may enable me. To, it doesn't exclude now a person who's taking alcohol. So it's important. Otherwise, so it's yeah. it's a good good point that way. Really. Now both of these are lifestyle problems. Actually, alcohol intake is harmful as well as uh, metabolic syndrome. So the underlying answer is to address it by behavioral interventions, etc., and counseling in a positive way without stigmatizing the person. One of the challenge right now, which we, which I see, even this week we had a problem. The person applies for an insurance claim after being admitted in the hospital. The insurance man is only looking at where did he write alcohol in the discharge summary. And this says he's turning down the claim. So now the person, patient is not happy to give the history of alcohol 
or writing back to say you got a wrong history from us after all it is only history so it's a problem so that is not good so again it needs us to think over it maybe uh, you know ha- has some interaction with the with the with the insurance industry and say that is not fair we have to address the problem we have to define the problem and don't uh, use that as a way of escape route to say to not provide insurance cover and these are all serious problem because where is the money going to come from for treatment so that's a problem there as well don't even can i ask a question is there anything called as sensible drinking or is there any very safe level limit of drinking can you say that less than this is not going to affect anything can okay. you say that? so let me let answer. me answer that in a light manner first a little joke joke manner so they used to say the definition of an alcoholic which we don't use any longer is a person who drinks more than me so that means anyone <laughs> will think i am a sensible drinker okay saying all that i am a teetotaler myself but i am just saying so that's one problem of how do we interpret my own drinking but there are definitions of harmful drinking heavy drinking hazardous drinking there are definitions so but i have not seen the definition of sensible drinking that must be a person who's not qualifying as a heavy drinker possibly and uh, whether the dose of alcohol changes with the uh, body mass index or with the age or a, a person who is a middle age or an adult drinking them on can a child drink that much or an elderly person can drink that much so this okay. matter uh, i guess is bit uncharted there but it makes sense to think that when there is more than one uh, uh, risk factor for liver disease it's possible it's possible that they'll have an additive effect or synergistic effect that's possible why why i ask this question is actually um at least in kerala the drinking pattern is changing as uh, sunil has already told it has gone into the younger populations you know so uh, so we ha- need to address on that and we also see people with uh, heavy body weight now you know whether they drink will they have a higher risk of developing alcohol related liver disease or a combination of uh, factors led on to liver disease all these factors matter that's why i asked a question so carrying forward uh, the same question is there a safe limit of alcohol or there's nothing safe in alcohol so there was a paper in lancet last year where they talked about this safe limit of alcohol ah uh, well i is now more of a personal opinion than anything else so uh, one is safe limit the other one is there are publications recommendations saying it is therapeutic to take alcohol in a small amount okay i doubt it but again i opinionate it it's my opinion only so it's not only a safe limit people even say it's good to take alcohol so i am not so sure but i do not know so uh, we see people who are taking alcohol and are not evidently having any uh, organ damage and then we think that is safe i guess that's how we would approach that so short answer is yes there must be but uh, as to what the limit is is uh, up for grabs i think uh, dr epen actually you know there are a lot of uh, research being going on for on anti fibrotic agents in patients with uh, nash now similar sort of fibrosis occurring after alcohol intake so bo- at both places the toxic agents are different lifestyle difference in uh, nfld and here you no know, somebody consuming alcohol so is there a role possible role of anti fibrotic agents in patients who are developing to develop cirrhosis early cirrhosis yeah thank you sir so basically uh, whatever applies to any other liver disease any other cause of liver disease or any other cause of cirrhosis applies here as well for treatment so there is a role for anti fibrotic agents as well surely but there has not been that much focus on that area specifically for alcoholic cirrhosis which i am not at least i am not often aware of but chances are there would be as well to say so it is generic i think what applies elsewhere so we are looking at opportunities to intervene to prevent progression of disease and to prevent complications that's our aim isn't it so that's what i would uh, i must say that i one uh, article i read about 15 years ago in hepatology struck me and it remains with me now uh, another four author- authors have now passed away andy barros is, is passed away as well so they predicted 
that in 10-15 years time, the prescription order for a person with liver disease will be similar to what somebody writes for, say, coronary artery disease. We know we, there will be some four or five drugs. So they said there will be four drugs. And the four drugs they had, were, one was a beta blocker, propranolol. Two was an anticoagulant, warfarin. Three was a, a antibiotic, norfloxacin. And four was a statin. So that is what they had. So basically, these are all hypothesizing that there is evidence for different mechanisms of liver injury, which can be countered by the appropriate drugs to counter that. So that that's how they had predicted. And as you see, that some of the some of the treatments are going in that direction as well. Uh, we've got a question in the chat box. Sir, addressing is like a clinical scenario. It's asked by Dr. Rajneesh Pulati, asking how do you differentiate. Hepatic encephalopathy from an alcohol withdrawal. Okay, hepatic encephalopathy from alcohol withdrawal is a a, a a situation clinical scenario which can be quite a serious scenario as well. The danger of giving a sedative drug to a person with advanced liver disease is that I may precipitate or worsen encephalopathy. On the other hand, if I do not treat or prevent withdrawal symptoms, somebody can throw a seizure, and that itself can have severe consequences. So this is the two-side danger. So one of the history, really, the person is has been consuming alcohol till I reach the hospital gate. Okay, I would say that, I would bet that's more likely going to be withdrawal, not gate, but I stopped six hours ago. If the story is, no, I stopped drinking two months ago, that is not withdrawal. That's more going to be like, um, hepatic encephalopathy. So the history is probably one key factor there and uh, looking at corroborating uh, clinical scenes, uh, uh, points around that. So I would be wary, I'd be careful about the use of sedatives in such patients. It is needed in a person with a withdrawal scenario, but it should be avoided in a person with encephalopathy. So that's the point to be noted. Can we go to the next poll question, sir? Or I I think if the, if it's available, all the poll questions could be run now. Yeah. The admin team, please share the questions now. So that first question is over. Oh, yeah. So what is the answer? What was the answer? Ten, uh, grams. Ten grams of alcohol is the correct answer. The okay, poll. in one standard drink. What was the poll? Can you just show us a poll result? 100 percent, guys. It was 100 percent initially. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll go for the second question now. You should show the poll results also. So the question was, what is the currently preferred screening tool for harmful alcohol use? Show us the poll answer. Even. Okay, so majority have opted for audit C, which is the correct answer. So audit C refers to the audit consumption question. C is for consumption. So audit has got 10 questions of three domains and three of them are on consumption of alcohol. And studies have said comparing cage with audit C, currently looks like audit C is more preferred as a screening tool for harmful alcohol use. So that's correct. Everybody is listening quite properly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the next question. Okay, this question is, which is the typical immune cell in a liver biopsy in a patient with severe alcoholic hepatitis? So what did the liver biopsy show? Is it neutrophil, lymphocyte, eosinophil, basophil? Okay, most people are going for the, okay, still voting is going on, I think. Yeah. All right, so 90% have gone, this is a correct answer, of neutrophil infiltration is the typical feature of severe alcoholic hepatitis. So, 
alcoholic hepatitis early had another term of acute alcoholic hepatitis one of the reasons for calling it acute may have been the fact that there is neutrophil infiltration in the liver as well now this indicates an overactive innate immune response so alcoholic severe alcoholic hepatitis or alcoholic aclf are syndromes with an overactive innate immune response and neutrophils found on the on the liver biopsy is uh, being characteristic just highlights that point and thereby treatments aimed at ameliorating an overactive innate immune response are uh, logically possible sounds good to do one more question no yes next question please there are two more questions i think so this yeah. question is the lily score refers to uh, alcohol use disorder screening tool response steroid therapy in severe alcoholic hepatitis response steroid therapy in moderate alcoholic hepatitis or recidivism after liver transplantation for alcoholic hepatitis can you see the old response very good okay so i think my talk is not needed looks like everyone is cracking it <laughs> so <laughs> but actually is a simple question so the majority are even the correct answer is response steroid therapy in in severe alcohol hepatitis i think almost everyone has got it correct the, your questions are simple okay. last question next question please okay this is a little more tougher question alcohol related acute and chronic liver failure aclf is same as severe alcoholic hepatitis is distinctly different syndrome from severe alcoholic hepatitis is distinctly different syndrome from severe alcoholic hepatitis with an overlap or they do not occur together with severe alcoholic hepatitis in the same patient looks like everyone is not voting some people are giving a pass to this question no i think all have voted yeah. so yeah. there is a little more spread here as i said there is a little more uh, vague question or a tougher question which i will discuss as it goes along but the correct answer is got by the majority of people that it's a distinctly different these two are different entities but they have an overlap so that become clear when we discuss that in the next session on the talk now i think the poll questions are over we go to the talk now yeah yeah shall we do that yeah, yeah. yes share your slides now i'll share screen again please uh, continue posting your questions you now we'll have a uh, question answer at the end again we'll go to the full screen full screen yeah once i get there yeah okay so is the screen visible yes 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 yeah. so the next topic is alcoholic hepatitis so as i mentioned these are now specific treatments and specific ways of analyzing it etc and uh, let's go into it so the diagnosis of alcoholic hepatitis so this is a diagnosis proposed by the niaa national institute for alcohol abuse i think funded alcohol hepatitis consortia in us where they defined alcohol hepatitis as onset of jaundice in the previous 8 weeks and with more than 6 months of heavy drinking till 2 months ago so the person should have been consuming alcohol at this dose till 2 months ago and the liver function derangement is bilirubin of more than 3 mg ast more than 50 with an ast to alt ratio of more than 1.5 and both ast and alt are less than 400 and excluding other causes of liver disease like drug induced liver injury should we be doing a liver biopsy to confirm a diagnosis of alcoholic hepatitis 
So this is a recommendation. In most patients, it is not needed to a biopsy. But if a biopsy is done, then it's termed as definite alcoholic hepatitis. Without a biopsy, it's either termed probable or possible. Probable alcoholic hepatitis is a person which clinically is, looks like alcoholic hepatitis and there are no other confounding factors. But if other etiological agents are confounding, then it becomes possible alcoholic hepatitis. And one sometimes may need to, to do a biopsy to try and differentiate the two. The severity of alcoholic hepatitis was initially and very popularly defined by the DEF score. So DEF score is the discriminant function score described by Madri et al. in the study in 1978, where he had talked about the experience of using steroids to treat alcoholic hepatitis. And when they did a stepwise discriminant analysis, that is a statistical tool of the factors which are predicting prognosis, they found that the baseline prothrombin time and serum bilirubin predicted the outcome. So that is why it's called discriminant function, DF score. And the DF score of 32 or more is uh, defines severe alcoholic hepatitis. However, the MEL score, which came along later, which is described only later, has been compared to DF score. And MEL predicts mortality in alcoholic hepatitis accurately and appears to be a better prognostic model than child score or DF score in alcoholic hepatitis. So increasingly, MEL scores seem to be more favored because it's a more accurate uh, assessment of the prognosis. So this is now the category of severity, categorizing the severity of alcoholic hepatitis as mild, moderate, severe, and very severe. Mostly this is information from the NIAAA Alcoholic Hepatitis Consortium. So they call this mild alcoholic hepatitis, which all of us probably rec uh, recognize, of patients who walk in and out of our outpatient clinic. He is fine, but he also is not so happy. So uh, he is a bit anxious. So once in six months or once a day, he will walk in and out of our out outpatient clinic again. He is asymptomatic. So there is an entity of mild alcoholic hepatitis. Severe alcoholic hepatitis is a DF score of 32 or higher or a MEL score of more than 20. Now, a term of moderate alcoholic hepatitis is DF score less than 30 or MEL less than 21. And now, recently there are publications addressing this, seeing this as an opportunity where we, can, we could intervene before the onset of severe alcoholic hepatitis. Most studies have within this area of severe alcoholic hepatitis, which is a condition of high short-term mortality. Many patients do not survive beyond 28 days. Many meaning 20 to 40 percent or 50 percent in different reports. There is an entity of very severe alcoholic hepatitis where the DF score is more than 60 or MELD is more than 30, where in this article they suggested they should have only palliative care because it's not, they, they were thought they were very sick. What about liver biopsy? So in this study done about 10 years ago, the liver biopsy in alcoholic hepatitis patients, four parameters were found to independently predict 90-day mortality. There were presence of bridging fibrosis, cirrhosis, presence of bilirubinostasis or cholestasis. is a poor prognostic factor, really. Severe neutrophil infiltration, which we refer to in the poll question and mega mitochondria, which is a finding on electron microscopy. So these are parameters which are known to produce, uh, to impact survival. Now, in the study from PSG in Coimbatore, of uh, 30 patients who underwent liver biopsy in severe alcoholic hepatitis, one-third had cirrhosis. So the presence of cirrhosis in patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis is a poor prognostic factor. But one can also have alcoholic hepatitis without underlying cirrhosis. So, the management of severe alcoholic hepatitis, I will be coming back to the slide again a bit later after discussing a few of these steps, but largely our treatment really is to give steroids, corticosteroids, prednisolone, and that's given at a dose of 40 milligrams per day and looking at response to this treatment or not. So, I'll come back to this slide after going through a few of these steps. 
So steroids, glucocorticoids have a transient beneficial effect. The survival is, be is better at 30 days in patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis, but there's no change in survival at 60 days or 90 days. So this is the largest study in this area, the STOPAR trial, which came out in 2015, an RCT, which showed that there's a trend to a better one-month survival when it was 28 days on the x-axis, but at a cost of increased infections. But there was no change in survival at 60 or 90 days. So this was the largest such trial which came out. Now, recent data, two years ago, where a multinational, more than 3,000 patients' data was analyzed, they found it appeared that the window of benefit in patients with uh, alcoholic hepatitis, severe alcoholic hepatitis, give steroids, was when the MELD was more than 20. And the more significant benefit was in the range of MELD 25 to 39. So thereby, steroids have a transient beneficial effect, better one month survival, but increase infections, but no change in 60 or 90 day survival. The therapeutic window, steroids may be better given uh, would be more beneficial in MELD more than 20. Maximum benefit is MELD of 25 to 39. And the data on pentoxifilin, which is part of the STOPA trial, further studies say that it is futile and is not worth using that in this scenario. So this is from uh, France, where Philip Mathurin looked at when they gave prednisolone at a dose of 40 milligrams per day for 28 days in severe alcoholic hepatitis, an early reduction of bilirubin by seven days predicted a better six-month survival. So that was a observation. As you can see on the graph, the curves are very different. In the person who's getting uh, steroids and within well, one week, there's a response or no response. If there was a response, that translated into six-month survival. So this now was taken further by the same group and became the Lilly model of using these six variables of age, creatinine, albumin, INR, bilirubin at baseline and day seven. And this score is predicting death at six months. A non-responder was a score of more than 0 0.45. So in such a patient, it's futile, it's considered futile to continue this therapy and look for alternative therapy. This being a high mortality, short-term mortality condition, a variety of different drugs have been used, interventions have been used, and one such intervention is use of enteral nutrition. Many patients are often malnourished, they may be hypercatabolic, etc. The goal for enteral nutrition is to give 35 to 40 kilocalories per kg per day, of which protein is 1.5 grams per kilogram per day. However, studies using specifically at enteral nutrition in severe alcoholic hepatitis, in this study along with steroids, found it was not effective. And in the, the study below, where they conclude that enteral feeding does not seem worse than steroids, though death occurred early with enteral nutrition. So, uh, per se, it's uh, common sense to give, may I try focus attention on nutrition by studies addressing this as an intervention did not find any remarkable benefit. What about the person who's not responding to steroids on Lilly score from the Western series? Why I'm saying Western series is the problem with infections in these already sick patients is a bigger problem in India. So whether somebody in India will tolerate 40 milligrams of prednisolone for 28 days or would we do them more harm is a problem. And I suspect that many, many physicians in India would not be giving 40 mg steroids per day. But that's a caveat to, to this discussion. So this is from the Western data set from Paris, uh, from the Lilly group again. So this is again landmark publication of patients who had received 40 mg of prednisolone for the first episode of severe alcoholic hepatitis. And the Lilly score was more than 0.45. That means they were non-responders. So in such patients, 21 such patients in three centers in France underwent early liver transplantation. And they compared them to matched historical controls. And they found that 
there was a significant uh, bet, better survival in six months, which maintained a two-year follow-up. So this was this uh, uh, changed the paradigm of treatment and how these patients were looked at, and thereby now world over many centers offer in selected patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis early liver transplantation has translated into better six month as well as two and five year survival and there is compare uh, comparative data in patients with alcohol related cirrhosis who underwent liver transplantation etc so uh, sorry this group is with uh, without liver early transplantation in alcoholic hepatitis and this is just cirrhosis per se so this uh, in selected patients is being given as a treatment option so thereby now i am coming back to this first algorithm a person with severe alcoholic hepatitis with a meld more than 20 can be is a candidate for steroid therapy as per the western strategy where the maximum benefit is a meld between 25 to 39 and they suggest to administer prednisolone 40 mg per day go by the uh, response per bilirubin at day 4 or the, day 7 that's a uh, lily model if it's less than 0.45, the bilirubin is coming down, complete four weeks. On the other hand, the bilirubin remains high, more than 0.45, stop prednisolone, more harm than good, and consider early liver transplantation if, if approved at their center or consider clinical trials. So this is standard teaching from the West. But I must say, this is not what I practice. I am worried about giving 40 mg of prednisolone for these patients in, in our setting. So there will be a very few patients who I would give steroids at this dose. But that I am happy to discuss that and I would look forward to comments from the other uh, moderators on this panel as well. The last topic I would like to discuss is, are alcoholic hepatitis and alcohol-related ACLF different entities or the same? So we know that acute and chronic liver failure, ACLF, there are two most popularly used definitions. One is the apacil, and the other one is the ESL. ESL definition focuses more on extrahepatic organ failure. There are six organs they are focused on based on the cliff sofa scores. While apacil is more based on the liver failure per se. And apacil seems to catch people earlier on in the illness without SAR as well, while ESL is later on in the illness. So, I think I'm, I'm just I added this on here just to conceptualize. Conceptually, alcoholic hepatitis would span even earlier be before the ACLF sets in by apacil as well. So these are definitions of apacil ACLF and ESL ACLF. I am not going into that. This this is not the mandate of this talk. Just that there are definitions available. And I've already discussed the definition of alcoholic hepatitis and how we can say severe alcoholic hepatitis based on the DF score and the MEL score. So this is the concept now. The concept is severe alcoholic hepatitis that is here on the on the on this uh, cartoon at the bottom. I'm showing mild, moderate, severe, and very severe alcoholic hepatitis. So severe alcoholic hepatitis and alcohol-related ACLF are distinct definitions of syndromes, but they are overlapping. So it is possible a person may have severe alcoholic hepatitis and not have ACLF, or a person would have severe alcoholic hepatitis and meet criteria of ACLF. Now I'm going more on the right side, from the middle and to the right of this graph. So the algorithm I refer to in the uh, from the NEGM paper last year, refers to severe alcoholic hepatitis. There's no mention about ACLF in that algorithm. When you bring in ACLF, which will be an overlap, then there are publications which say that it's harmful to use steroids in this scenario. So this is where the challenge comes, uh, how we should, uh, and how, and we will all vary in what we practice here as well. So, but what is done? What are the new things in this area? So the new things, because people have keeping on looking at how can we improve survival in this high death, high short-term mortality. So one such interesting study 
work is many of these studies are from india as i am happy to share them one such is from on fecal microbiota transplantation fmt in steroid ineligible patients they were ineligible because either they had infections or raised creatinine or recent gi bleed mostly because of infections and siriak philips had done this work while he was at ilbs delhi dr sarin is a senior author showing dramatic improvement in response if of uh, survival and this has now been replicated in a recent paper from i think this from pj chandigarh where again fmt in alcohol aclf seems to be beneficial to use second is the use of gcsf granulocyte cold stimulating factor papers are from different centers from ilbs from P- this particular study i'm referring to is from pj chandigarh etc uh, they have explored this and these studies seem to indicate that there is a beneficial role however a recent paper from europe a multi center study was terminated midway finding there was no benefit and but that was not in alcoholic aclf that was in aclf due to various etiologies the common etiology remains alcohol so the jury is out again but it seems that the experience in the west is different from the experience in india or maybe the patient selection are different there are different interpretations of this i as my comment was the same difference is there with steroid use as well 40 mg of prednisolone per day in a sick patient like this in india is daunting and i must say in most patients i do not do, use that in our center we are more uh, we like this treatment and we think increasingly in india many centers are using this this is the use of plasma exchange and low dose steroid we give 10 mg of prednisolone in this particular paper all patients had alcohol related aclf by the apasal definition and they all met the criteria for severe and very severe alcoholic hepatitis that's the group so there is some marginal improvement in survival though it is statistically significant it doesn't look very impressive but on this it it appeared so but when we reanalyze the same data set when we compare the centrifugal type of plasma exchange plasma exchange can be done by two two techniques centrifugal or membrane type the survival came curves look more impressive however in the smt group standard medical treatment group we do not give steroids that's been our practice in al- patients who, who meet criteria of alcoholic aclf it was suggested that we should use propensity matched analysis so we have done that now and when we do that again the same holds good so for the psm analysis we had to could only have two arms we took out the membrane arm and again the survival curves look in, uh, impressively different so increasingly we think that this is a role for for these patients to uh, treatment to be considered which i think is already happening i am aware not i think i am aware is happening in many centers in india so that's my last slide really so i've covered this uh, important seriously ill patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis and alcoholic aclf the recommendations in the west are very sim- are quite simple actually for severe alcoholic hepatitis but in india they are difficult to Uh, administer giving 40 mg of prednisolone for 28 days most patients may not be given that i think but i may be wrong that's just my opinion but increasingly newer treatment modalities are being explored in different centers and they may have a re- role in the future thank you uh, i think there are some questions uh, dr sunil uh, sunil and yeah i think um, yeah So, sir, um, you mentioned about role of liver biopsy. These are very sick patients. It's really difficult to do liver biopsy. So, Virinder uh, from Rotak has asked us, uh, how about the role of fibro scan? Does it have any utility? So, fi- thank you. So, fibro scan is basically about liver fibrosis, primarily, I think, in a setting of alcoholic ACLF or alcoholic hepatitis. there's going to be significant inflammation in the liver as well which also will uh, increase the fibrosis scores fibro scan score that's one thing to keep in mind but is there a role yes there is a role but the role would be more in either earlier in stages of liver disease 
say in fatty liver progression or in cirrhosis progression but not in the setting of of alcoholic hepatitis the confounder of inflammation in the liver would be a fun factor which which we have to keep in mind which is which uh, is against his utility there uh, so there's another question uh, in the chat box by dr sudhir and he's asking that how do we differentiate between alcohol related fatty liver disease uh, and due to nafld in patients who are consuming alcohol in significant amount and in continuation in the, of the same question there's another question by dr virender chohan and he's asking how do you differentiate nash from ash okay uh, i do not have all the answers so i can tell you the questions where i have no answers so answer is no answer so uh, there is no good way of differentiating alcoholic hepatitis from nash the there are some histological parameters which are seen more in one or the other but mostly they are the same in fact that is how nash was first described the histology was it looked like ash they all blamed it on me but i never took alcohol so short answer is we can't differentiate is easier to make a diagnosis another way rather than the, rather than the liver biopsy to say if a person has got features of metabolic syndrome clinically that person would be having nash or has a propensity for nash so i think that's how i would approach it my i am always keeping on thinking how can i intervene in a positive way so if there is evidence of nash metabolic syndrome i should intervene there and if there is evidence of alcohol harmful alcohol i should intervene there but it is not so much on histology which really speaking does not differentiate very well Uh, so I one questions there by uh, ankit from amdabad so what he has raised is a point regarding is the contraindications for use of steroids we know as you said that steroids improve the short term 20 day mortality so is there a creatinine value on which you would be concerned that above which you would not like to give these patients steroids thank you so so first comment this by and large i don't use 40 mg of steroids routinely it will be the minority of patients because i think most patients will meet aclf criteria in severe alcoholic hepatitis and then there are publications saying that it it's the jury is out you may do more harm than good in that area really but publication the even the stopar trial for example excluded patients with a raised creatinine for their study so i think i am using uh more uh, like that rather than a particular number per se so i think if creatinine is elevated i would not go for steroid but that's again just my opinion it is just if you ask me i'm just telling my opinion maybe i'll ask the opinion of shalimar and sunil what do you think i think i would agree with that so we don't have data on use even those initial all trials on steroids and alcoholic hepatitis at contraindications in terms of renal failure gi bleed pancreatitis sepsis so these would be garden variety patients which have been excluded so we don't have data and would agree that yes the sicker group of aclf using steroids may cause more harm so we're looking at more infections and infection we know is a killer in such patients so we need to be very worried and careful like uh, not to use drugs which cause more harm rather than causing benefit which is still a little doubtful in such a sick group of patients so you would like to take the next one same experience as ours we are not able to give steroids you know because most of them would come with very severe disease and they end up getting infections so i think there's another very important question which has been raised in this uh, so if your clinical diagnosis is suppose alcoholic liver disease and the patient denies alcohol intake so this is question by dr said how do we utilize the various tests to check whether the patient is taking alcohol or not okay see uh, good question there are answers on that that means there are tests available so what are the tests to know is there alcohol right now being consumed or not so one is uh, plasma alcohol breath analyzer etc is available the policemen are using it breath analyzer and all so that's one thing possible to is to look at metabolites in the system some of which are not affected by liver diseases and set them up and use it okay how are the challenges uh, why are we doing this like you know like so that becomes little more is a research tool is okay as a clinical tool i am not so sure of the utility you know i am just how do they change what i am doing 
but it's it's a reasonable question to ask i am not saying no so i think i would go more by the history i am not doing any detective role beyond that really i must say uh, but it's a research tool okay otherwise is a theoretical question i think what i sir i think there are a lot of questions on the therapeutic aspects you covered um, uh, nutrition we talked about steroids plasma exchange now there is a group of compounds which are called as hepatoprotective drugs so what is your take on that sir okay. especially questions have been raised on a drug called as metadoxin okay okay uh <clears throat> there are multiple mechanisms of liver injury so if if we can target any of them it is potentially likely to be beneficial that is the aim of how we go at it but liver is a, is the factory so there are zillions of of uh, things which are going wrong so any of them uh, could could they be beneficial by reversing is a logic but what has come out as showing translating as clinical benefit may not be so many so many really so i would say it's an open question for me i am aware that there are multiple mechanisms of injury and there will be newer and newer drugs but do i routinely use this answer is no i do not but that doesn't mean i am right it just means that's what i am using and i am sure all of us will vary with it what we use in this area so i should use drugs which are one not doing any harm two there's a potential for benefit and three i should also keep uh, an eye on the finances as well and be reasonable in what i would choose so these are the factors which determine that but routinely do i use no i do not use okay next question you deliver sir your sir deoxycholic acid so we got i think we can have a 2020 very quick answers to that because uh, so you deliver your call sir or your okay. sir deoxycholic acid okay okay routinely no answer is no i do not routinely use but in a person with a high bilirubin and he is looking at me and asking what what can you give me i don't mind giving it it's it's a both way in which case i wish the utilive cost can be also also cost can be a bit less it's a pretty stiff cost for a, for a drug like this if it made a bit right. cheaper more people will use it probably right so the quick answer is we need more data nsetal cysteine sir there is data now that nac along with steroids may be beneficial but more studies are needed is a powerful antioxidant we have some interest in wwf wwf is a mucus like mucin like stuff and nac you know is a mucolytic agent that's why even cystic fibrosis is used so there are different theoretical mechanisms so it could be used and i must say in sick people we are using it especially in our plex gang of people we are using that Okay. The question from Dr. Sudhir Maharshi is: Is there a role of intoxicilin in today's this scenario, especially in relation to those patients who got an AKI? Yeah, the logic for pentoxifilin was in AKI and were preventing AKI. How was the last year's NEGM article says it's futile? That's what that article has has given a line on it. That is just the current thinking. It may change again, but as of now, it's. not uh, not uh, fashionable to use pentoxifil in this area new kid on the block saroglitazar saroglitazar in alcoholic hepatitis i'll wait wait to hear more about it i yeah. i see okay. more in, in the nash scenario maybe nash plus ash can be considered i guess i think we need we need data on it rather before yeah. we comment absolutely it's it's, it's, it's utility um the other drug what again sudhir maharshi has again raised the question any role of bovine colostrum bovine colostrum is a very interesting uh, concept and is likely to be beneficial sandeep siddhu from ludhiana has been uh, passionate about it and i know there's an rct now happening and he has personally discussed with me that he's seen patients turn around very well with this my sense is it will work but i'm waiting for the rct date, data to come out doctor you can roll yeah yes please sir yeah role of uh, de addiction at what time we should intervene at what time we should actually refer these patient to a psychiatrist yeah so uh, i'll tell you two comments on that one is surely that is not so much in our territory but we should uh, if available Uh, we should uh, encourage one ec psychiatric counseling in this area to do and every you know it's earlier the better 
But the difference for me is something I would like to share. Now, more and more, I am getting older in my field. So, 20 years ago, I may be even shouting at a patient or talking harshly to say, stop alcohol or something. Now, my language has changed. Now, I'm saying, I am requesting you to stop alcohol. <laughs> okay? But I say, as a senior doctor, I am requesting you to stop alcohol. I say a couple of times, I like it. So, I think, uh, yeah. But I, I agree, that's something where we need input from other specialities. Alcohol needs a multi-pronged approach and different specialties that come in is a very vital input. Well, family support is very important in this area, etc. There are many questions. Uh, if, uh, at 10 minutes more, Sunil, can you take a few more questions? Uh, yes, sir. The role of S-adenosine, methionine and probiotics. This is another question which has been asked in the chat box. Yeah. So again, jury is out. I think we need more data. One of the ways how bovine cholesterol acts, two main mechanisms, one is it may be a prebiotic and two, it contains lactoferrin, which has got an anti-inflammatory action. So there are different mechanisms and it's up to us to do appropriate studies in those areas and see if they are beneficial or not. But right now, do I give it routinely? No, I do not. Okay. And uh, s adenosine methanine? Sammy. It's, it's uh, currently not on my, my list of drugs, but that doesn't mean I'm right. It's just that that's my opinion. And silimarin is also a drug which is kind of promoted. So should we use milk thistle and uh, silimarin? Silimarin is the European Ayurveda drug. It's not a modern medicine drug. We have to be aware of that. But maybe it's beneficial, but that's what it is. Milk thistle is, uh, is a herbal plant in Europe. So, in a nutshell, what is your prescription for alcoholic hepatitis? So, usually when a person comes, as I mentioned, in any tertiary care center, person has gone to one, two or three hospitals. My job is to cut down drugs. I don't give so many drugs. I start reducing it. However, I start to first categorize where are they in the stages of illness. And I'm aware, I'm looking out for the person in severe alcoholic hepatitis or ACLF, high short-term mortality, where I you think about admitting them or doing more uh, appropriate treatments for them. Uh, other spectrum of, of liver diseases, as I said, appropriately is what I would do and no, no different from any other patient with cirrhosis. But what we prescribe, even among the people uh, on the faculty today, in this, will vary between ourselves. That's how it is. That doesn't mean one person is right or wrong, but we should have some logic how we go at, go at it. As Shalima mentioned, many of these do not have robust clinical outcomes data as yet. There are uh, studies looking at mechanisms, but not necessarily clinical outcomes, survival, etc. That's what is needed. It is likely the field will move on and mo some of the drugs will be found to be useful. And uh, we have to keep abreast of that field, really. So one Anand is, has, yeah, so Sunil, just one way interesting. The Anand has raised a question from Hyderabad. So, regarding the combination of plasma exchange and the use of steroids. So, in plasma exchange, if you're removing most of the cytokines or and both the pro anti and the immunoprotective immunoglobulin, so would adding up steroids in such patients won't it add up to the risk of infections? Yeah. No, it's very true. And uh, the infections is a big problem here. There is a lot of work from uh, PGI Chandigarh focusing on fu invasive fungal infections. Nippun has worked on that as well. So it's not only a bacterial problem. So it's a dangerous game, really. So what we have done here at Pellor is we give a very low dose steroid of 10 mg of prednisone, which is a laughable dose, really. But we, in our experience, it works when we started before giving the uh, starting the plasma exchange, and then the how long we give it for later is a clinical call, really, to say. Now, uh, I, I know it's uh, there are differences how we all do plasma exchange in different centers as well. But our observation was when we did plasma exchange without giving steroids, the person improved. But when we stopped plasma exchange, all the numbers boomerang back, and the person became sick, and... Uh, three patients died like that. So once we move to this protocol, it seems to work well for us. But always the bugbear is infections. That's something we have to keep proactively looking for and uh, stop it at the earliest time of infection. But otherwise, we like we find it, it a good good thing to do. 
So the Dr. other Ipan. one more question is uh, by uh, okay. as we know that malnutrition is an issue, and Anupama Nagar has asked a question: Is how do you take care of nutrition in such patients who got say renal failure, who got other problems coming in? So how do you take care of these calories and proteins which are recommended to be say two thousand, two thousand five hundred, and calories sixty gram proteins when you can't give in so much of fluids? How are we? And these patients are anorexic. They'll not eat. They'll not have appetite. How so? In your clinical practice, how do you make sure that you are taking care of calories and proteins? Thank you. That's an important, very important area, really. So I'll tell you uh, two comments on that. First comment is not exactly the question asked. That is, often I would say eight, nine out of ten patients are the other side. They are they are restricting their diet. Because my neighbor tells me, don't eat masala. Next guy says, don't eat oil. Take oil. Don't drink milk. So I am getting malnourished because I am restricting my food. I lost ten kilos of weight. Then I think my liver disease is causing me to lose weight. So almost in every outpatient, in at least two patients, I'll be explaining this in a way, and the guy likes it because his family has not been giving him the the normal. Everybody is eating what is uh, tasty food, and he is getting some. some food is peculiar so this is a phenomenon in india and that's something to look out for but the question asked is the patient who is admitted and who is sick and uh, how do you ensure calories how much to go in that is the most challenging area i would say what i can give i give i am not going after it more than that because intensive enteral nutrition as per the trials was a challenge to did not find much benefit as well so i don't go beyond that too much but of course i have to keep my eye, eye on nutrition and try to encourage as much as possible and oral enteral nutrition whenever it's possible yeah dr ipin a uh, little bit detail of your plex uh, regime you gave in these patients okay uh plex is a talk by itself uh, many people here have given these talks so plasma exchange has got is uh, i would think uh, I, i must say i first heard of it this from matthew philip So uh, Matthew has been doing that at least one year before we started doing in CMS. Well, that means I'm, I'm aware at least twenty or forty centers in India now are doing this for this for liver disease. Plasma exchange is done by uh, the amount of the volume of plasma exchange can be categorized into three: high volume, standard volume, or low volume. So an adult has got five liters of blood, half is plasma, so two point five liters is plasma. So, if we in the study by Larson from Denmark, they used ten liters of plasma exchange per day. That means four to five times the plasma volume. The title was high volume plasma exchange. Studies now from AIMS, from ILBS, from PGI Chandigarh, large, and uh, from AIG Hyderabad, which have all been published, have all used mostly standard volume. So, one is to one plasma exchange. we have used low volume plasma exchange we use half the volume so that means if it is 2.5 liters we go by 1 liter per day and we have stuck to that really about that now again not saying one over the other is correct i am not saying that no any of them would be fine to see so if you can achieve the same benefit by a lower volume then naturally the resource required is less as well as the chance of complications related to the procedure are lesser if the benefit is the same but as of now there is no head to head trial comparing low volume with high volume or standard volume so that's where it stands on that and the peculiarity in our regime which we follow at velour is that we give everyone 10 10 mg of prednisolone but that is because of the observation we had in three patients where it when when it all improved when it stopped flex everything boomerang and the patient died but when we covered it with starting with the low dose before that seemed to ameliorate this inflammatory milieu cytokine storm sort of a thing but that is just an assumption only it's only clinical observation again so it's a, a changing field but i guess that increasingly already more centers are doing this so in these patients with are in severe alcoholic hepatitis very severe alcoholic and interestingly the three contraindications for steroids are different here one is creatinine is not a problem we had a patient up to creatinine of 7 and still improved and anyway, it may have been his good fortune but is no longer a contraindication infection yes active infection we wouldn't give and uh, 
recent GI bleed, we we have not been doing. But creatinine is no longer a problem in this area as well. Doctor, Maybe I'll ask Shalimar and Matthew for his opinion on Plex and Sunil. Uh, so you all are doing Plex in your centers. Uh, uh, do you give antibiotics when you give a combination of low-dose steroids and Plex? Will you try giving uh, prophylactic antibiotics or at the initiation will you give antibiotics? Yes. Thank you. We have a very aggressive policy towards infections. So yes, we take surveillance blood culture. We give prophylactic IV antibiotic. And if, if despite all this, a person gets an infection, which either is clinically detected or a bacterial illness, we'd stop, stop Plex and steroids. So that's our package. But with all that, it seems that majority of people do not have severe infections or problem, and we are able to get away with that. I think uh, there will be many questions. I know that. But, uh, can we, we have only two minutes more? Elima? Sunil, any pressing comments you want to make on this? So I, I think uh, uh, there are two questions here which I wanted to ask. Is it important to differentiate alcoholic hepatitis from ACLF? And does, it, does this have implications on outcome and treatment? And will it help in deciding about the treatment? And the second question is that you, we've talked about Plex and uh, uh, in, in, in alcoholic hepatitis. So are you considering therapies like GCSF or FMT also now as uh, experimental therapies or in your clinical practice? Okay. Thank you, Sunil. Now, more and more, this is my opinion only, opinionated. And disclaimer is, I may well be wrong. It's just my opinion. So first is, if there was somebody with severe alcoholic hepatitis without ACLF, here the patient, I would consider using steroids like what is given in the West. Okay. But... I don't find such patients often. So that's the problem. So, so that's the reason to differentiate ACLF from alcoholic, severe alcoholic hepatitis. We can consider giving steroids as advice in the West. And there will be such patients. And uh, in a setting without infections, one can consider giving steroids and go by the Lilly score. Whether it's 40 mg or 20 mg is a call we have to make. Secondly, the use of GCSF and FMT they all have benefits. It's an open book. However, I have some uh, opinions of my own in them. In FMT, the issue is administering the treatment is a challenge, I guess. Administering Plex is not so much difficult to do. So unless FMT is come packaged as some sachet or some capsules, that is one uh, practical problem, really, about the use of F FMT. And GCSF, again, there are more studies ongoing because currently the European study has shown contrary results, but not in alcohol per se, in ACLF for all comers. So I think these are all emerging fields only, and we should not use it routinely, but in uh, in a center which has got the, whatever the algorithm for it and been working on it, I would encourage it to be done. Even can I make a question? In the center, does the my flex therapy, the blood bank or the nephrology department? Yeah. So there are two departments involved in, in administering plasma exchange. One is a clinical department, which is hepatology or gastroenterology. And two is who is administering it. The second person who administers it can either be nephrology, can be transfusion medicine or blood bank, or can be an intensivist. They are all well versed with these treatments. Now, the preferred treatment is centrifugal plasma exchange. There's no doubt about it now. The question is who can offer that and what is the facility in each center? The chances are that every hospital already has this facility. It's just it's not getting utilized enough to say. So answer is it can be anyone so long as this treatment of centrifugal plasma exchange is done. So it's not necessarily any particular speciality. Dr. Shalimar, your final comments and questions? I think, sir, um, we've had um, an excellent talk by Professor Epen and um, covered most um, um, important issues from diagnosis to management. And the more is the controversial issues regarding the management. So I think we had a great learning opportunity over here. And uh, we've answered most of the questions in the chat box, and I don't think we've got any more additional specific uh, questions left, sir. Uh, sir, Dr. Yeah. Sam, 
final points yeah yeah dr ipun excellent talk very clear carry home messages on a uh, rather difficult subject a very common problem and uh, thank you moderators there were almost actually a century of questions and you have taken them so well thank you so much thank so you. thank you everyone we had a fantastic uh, i guess in master class the very purpose of master class is being filled and uh, in a very practical discussion and uh, the speaker did the job very well and that fantastic uh, uh, well experienced moderators took up questions very well and they in fact refined questions in such a way that the question can be answered or asked very well so rather than directly asking the same questions you know it is fantastic though it about in one level that shows them how well they are experienced in field you know so happy and privileged to have you people on the uh, board and uh, we will have the next session after two weeks on management of gastroesophageal reflux disease and this is a very well attended meeting and i appreciate and thank all of you for the Uh, effort you have taken i also thank uh, nisha who is doing our secretarial job as well as a wonderful job arranging all this and also the admin team who have done a uh, flawless work on that thank you so much we'll sign off now see you after two weeks thanks a lot thank you very much thank you thank, thank you. you thank you very much